This is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of January 9th, 2021. The weekly top three is a regular segment on the Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on Facebook Live and via streaming audio from the show's website weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.25 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages, also on the new Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the projects page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you also can follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaska for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we look at the upcoming House Finance Committee session on the governor's proposed budget. Second, we look at what impact the new argument by some at the federal level that debt doesn't matter is likely to have on Alaska. And third, we discuss why it's important to understand this coming legislative session, what's going on with oil prices over the longer term. And now let's join Michael. Let's talk a little bit about what uh, is going to be facing us this year with the top three first of the year. Uh, we're going to start off with this lame duck House Finance Committee meeting. Uh, they're holding a hearing uh, tomorrow, and they're going to be going over the governor's budget. And I see that we've got some names there that we recognize. Larry Persilli, one. Uh, Legislative Finance Division is going to be there as well. What are we expecting to see here? Uh, what are we likely to hear from the uh, House Finance Committee and their review of the governor's budget? Well, the, the first thing you need to understand about this hearing is it's Jennifer Johnston's last stamp. Um, uh, it, this, is, this is Jennifer uh, calling her last, in, in, in the last legs of, of her term, uh, calling, um, uh, calling a House Finance Committee hearing on the governor's budget. And you can sort of, you can sort of, you, if you didn't know anything else, you can sort of tell how this is going to go from uh, from there. Jennifer being one of the Republicans that got that got defeated in the primary last year for having joined the the bipartisan majority and having supported PFD cuts. Um, there is there is one good thing, and then and then and then one not so good thing about the hearing. Uh, the the overview from legislative finance, I'm actually looking forward to. Now, we have to remember that in the course of the last year, um, uh, uh, David Teal, who had been the legislative finance uh, director, retired, uh, was was succeeded uh, by uh, uh, the former OMB director, who's now uh, at the University of Alaska, um, and now um, – uh, has had she when she moved to the University of Alaska, they had to replace her. And now uh, Alexi Pater is the new legislative finance uh, uh, director. And I'm frankly uh, pleased by that. I think Alexa Alexi um, uh, is is much more truly nonpartisan than we've had uh, in the past. Uh, I think is going to be even handed. Uh, you'll recall that. Uh, Donna and I had a discussion about uh, Alexi on one of the shows uh, this past year, and uh, both of us were were very high on him. He'd worked for Donna when she was OMB director, um, and I think that that the I'm really looking forward to Alexi's presentation. He did one uh, on on the state fiscal situation last fall when Jennifer called a, a post a, a fall hearing in advance of the election, actually to. I think try to influence the coverage of of the last few days before the election, um, and he did a very even-handed uh, uh, presentation. He's adopted um, an approach to talking about the budget that that divides uh, the budget into or looks at the budget through two lenses. One is current law, what current law provides, uh, and how the budget looks under current law. Uh, that includes a full PFD because that's in the law. 
uh, and then one that's current policy, and, as opposed to Teal and, and how others had presented it in the past, which was basically this is the end result that we want, so let's look at the budget this way. I think Alexi takes a much more these are the facts approach, uh, or at least he did in the presentation last fall. Um, and in my conversations with him, I, I, I think he will continue to do so. Um, and, and, I, and I think that's going to be a positive. The, the overlay on all this, though, is, is sort of hilarious. I mean, to have Larry personally come in uh, and do an over – it says governor's budget assessment by Larry personally. Well, we, we know that Larry – we know what Larry's biases are. We see them periodically on the editorial page of the uh, of the Anchorage Daily News. We see them uh, in um, in speeches he gives and comments he gives. Uh, and we know that uh, his view is that uh, the PFD should be treated as government revenue. It should be included as part of the uh, as part of the revenue that the government has the opportunity to spend. Um, and I anticipate that the assessment is going to be uh, along along those lines, particularly since it's Jennifer Johnston's last stand. Uh, uh, I think that she's bringing in Larry, frankly, to uh, uh, to, to bias the. Uh, Bias the analysis of the uh, of the governor's budget uh, uh, in that way. I'm so, sure. I'm sure it'll make some great headlines uh, for the following day. I'm sure James Brooks will write some kind of glowing piece about how Larry Persilli just dissects it with real acumen and uh, complete dispassion. Well, one one of the one of the reasons you use Larry, or one of the reasons that Jennifer would use Larry, is because Larry has has uh, a, a, a strong connection to the Alaska press. I mean, he's. He's uh, been a journalist himself. He's owned newspapers. He's a journalism professor. Uh, he and Tim Bradner teach a course for journalists uh, in advance of the legislature about you know legislative process and about budget uh, budget issues. Uh, and he's got strong connections to the press. So you bring him in uh, to do exactly that to, uh, to 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 you know make a presentation that the press is going to is sort of trained, uh, if you will, to listen to and. Uh, and so, and so you you get somebody who's who's you know, a, who purports to be a journalist and look at things analytically, but who, who certainly comes in with a certainly comes in with a bias as you see show up in the opinion pages. So it's going to be it, it, again to go back to the beginning. It's Jennifer Johnson's last stand. It's her effort, I think, to to tilt uh, the the pre legislative. Uh, uh, start the press and the pre-legislative startup to tilt how how the how uh, uh, the media is going to be covering the legislature to tilt how uh, people perceive uh, the issues as they come into the legislature. I think for those listening, uh, I would listen and I would uh, spend a lot of time looking at whatever presentation Alexi makes that Legislative Finance Division makes. I think that's going to be solid. I think that's going to give us some insight into how at least. That uh, piece of the legislature is breaking down the budget, um, and I, and then beyond that, I would sort of take uh, uh, Larry's uh, analysis sort of with a grain of salt and uh, and say, okay, well, that's the that's the op-ed view of it. That's Jennifer's op-ed view of it. Let's, uh, <laughs> let's move on. Well, there's a lot of uh, there's a lot of last minute hurrahs going on here from the lame duckers as they go out. I mean, between the legislative council and Jennifer Johnson and everything else, they're like. Any last stab they can take at the electorate, it seems like that's their choosing here. Yeah, it's. Um, I mean, to some degree, uh, the the legislature. We we don't have an organized legislature. Neither the Senate nor the House are organized. So, in sort of that vacuum, leadership vacuum, uh, the old guard is uh, is stepping in, uh, and uh, and you know trying to trying to put their imprint on on what's coming in and. You know that's their that's their right to do so. If we had if we had an organization in the Senate and the House, they would be sort of uh, 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 setting the agenda for the run up to uh, to this coming legislature. But uh, we don't have an organization in either body, so the old legislature is stepping into that leadership vacuum and and is uh, and is trying to direct things. I, I just it, it's it's you know I Jennifer I, I've not agreed with Jennifer's position since she's position since she's since she's joined the house and she's you know joined the 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 take the pfd caucus and uh and i think it's a little bit of bad form to try to you know steer do the use this last 
last-minute hearing or this last-day hearing to uh, to sort of steer, try to steer the the media reaction to it. But as I say, I mean, I you just sort of got to understand what Larry's going to say and set that aside, and really look for substance from what Alexi's going to come in right. and, and talk about uh, in the uh, in the legislative finance division presentation. Any uh, anything surprising you think is going to come out of this, or is it uh, you know any anything we should be looking for other than that? There's going to be there's going to be some fine tuning going on uh, that I think is important. Um, this year we're going to end up a little bit better off. Uh, the current the current fiscal or yeah, FY 21 we're going to end up a little bit better off than, than or it looks like we're going to end up a little bit better off. Oil prices are a little bit higher, uh, well significantly higher. I think than what the legislature initially predicted when they did the budget. The, the budget was done on a on a prediction of thirty seven dollar uh, A and S, and now we're going to end up at about forty seven dollars, about three hundred million dollars higher in terms of A and S. That means it's going to be or oil revenues. That means there's going to be a lower uh, draw from the CBR, which means more CBR, a, a higher CBR left over for the for the following year, um, and. Uh, we're, we're not quite sure where expenses are going. Medicaid's likely going to be up, but we don't know by how much. Uh, so it's going to be there's going to be some fine tuning here that I think is is useful to help set the tone or set the set the stage for what this coming legislature is going to be facing uh, uh, as they as they try to set the FY22 budget and as they try to try to deal with the FY21 uh, uh, supplemental. So I it's. I, I, the, the the numbers, how the numbers are shaking out as we move through uh, the fall and move through the end of the calendar year, uh, and now have a, a, a different outlook for oil prices for the remainder of this fiscal year and and indeed for the next fiscal year. Um, I think those those numbers are going to be important. I'm certainly going to be looking at them, and they're certainly going to lead me to to fine tune the charts and the and the projections and the analysis that. Uh, uh, that we do. So uh, I would be looking for that. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, is our guest. Uh, we're talking about the weekly top three. Let's uh, do our quick 90-second, uh, two-minute tease here on number two, which is the federal debt. It's going to have an impact on us. Does it really matter to Alaskans overall, though? What is it, you know, in terms of uh, future aid and in terms of other things? Uh, give us a brief synopsis. Well, there's a new there's there's new economic uh, uh, thinking or new economic uh, approaches that are emerging in Washington um, uh, in the run up to the to the uh, next administration to the Biden administration, and uh, I think they're going to have a significant impact federally, uh, but I think they're also going to have a knock on effect on Alaska. Basically, a number of of economists are arguing now that debt doesn't matter, uh, or at least it doesn't matter much. National debt doesn't matter much, and deficit spending doesn't matter much. Actually, it's sort of the Democrat version of the Republicans' trickle-down supply-side economics theory. If you cut taxes, it's going to produce increased revenue. That's never happened on the supply side, but the Democrats have sort of come up with the with a debt doesn't matter uh, uh, theory that uh, sort of would, would enable them to to increase spending without uh, without the constraints you normally associate with uh, concerns about debt. So uh, we're going to talk about the impact of what that's going to have a little bit at the federal level, but more on the Alaska level. But let's get back to it. We were talking about before the break the debt and the effect, uh, if any. I mean, I, I think it's going to be an effect. But what is the effect? on Alaska, uh, especially moving forward as we look at the financial solutions that are coming up in front of us. I mean, we just uh, we had a $2 trillion aid package. We've got another one here that's nearly a trillion dollars. Uh, they've, again, been pushing for even more. And, of course, I imagine that as this COVID thing continues to creep out, there may be more on the horizon. And that's just the COVID stuff, not to mention just regular spending and everything else. Debt is in our future. What is the effect on us, Brad? Well, I, uh, it's important to understand the theory that uh, that, that people are using, uh, economists in D.C. are using to, to support this. Basically, what they're saying is interest rates are so low uh, that you can go out and and borrow a bunch of money, uh, invest it uh, through government spending uh, to to generate economic activity, and the growth of the economy, the resulting growth of the economy 
from that additional government spending will generate uh, additional income or de generate additional uh, 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 tax revenues that offset uh, the uh, the increased interest that uh, that's resulting from uh, that's resulting from the debt. It's all premised on these low interest rates, and they say, and and the argument is, look at look at what what's happened recently uh, with all of the borrowing the federal government's been doing, uh, both uh, uh, in the first part of the Obama administration, the second part of the Obama administration, certainly in the Trump administration, which has grown debt uh, dramatically even before COVID uh, with, the, with the tax cuts and with, with big spending bills. All of that has had very, it hasn't bumped interest rates uh, uh, much at all. And so the argument uh, is that that will continue into the future. We can continue to generate debt. We'll just borrow the money. Have to pay. We don't have to pay much interest on it. Uh, and uh, and and the uh, and we can continue to spend, generate economic activity, and and sort of grow our way. It's going to sound familiar. Grow our way out of the deficits deficit by strategic investments of. Uh, of, of government money. That all blows up at some point. I mean, it blows up when interest rates finally uh, head back toward historic norms. There's reasons why interest rates are low now. There's reasons why they won't be, uh, wouldn't be long term. That all sorts of blow, blows up when, uh, when interest rates uh, uh, start rising again. And you have, to, you have to keep in mind that government debt is not financed largely, not financed by long term borrowing it's not 30 year borrowing it's mostly 5 and 10 year uh 10 year borrowing and so when interest rates blow up it's not it's not you have to worry about it when you finally roll over your debt in 30 years you have to worry about it when your debt starts rolling over in 5 years or in 10 years and if you have a huge stock of debt uh that uh, that you're carrying uh you know interest rates doubling interest rates are tripling uh going from 1% to 2% to 3% uh, uh, back toward historic norms, uh, that blows up the interest costs on the budget uh, uh, very quickly and, uh, and and very significantly. Well, but and that assumes it, that assumes, by the way, that government investment and I I got air quotes around that government investment is the most efficient use of that money. I mean that which uh, again historically I think we could show is probably not the case. Exactly right. Exactly right. So, so there's, so you've got this situation where, where people are making this argument is justifying uh, continued borrowing. Uh, there's a lot of buy-in in it in DC. Is justified justifying continued borrowing. It's justifying people talking about these two thousand uh, dollar stimulus payments. Don't worry about that. We'll finance that with that. Uh, it's never going to come back uh, to bite us. Um, and and so that has two effects in Alaska, and I think they're important effects. One is uh, you, we're sort of creating this time bomb nationally uh, that will go off at some point with interest, with increased interest costs, which will then result in blowing up uh, the cost of the budget, uh, the annual budget, start crowding out other things. And because Alaska is so tied to federal spending, I mean, military spending, uh, uh, other, other types of federal spending that occurs in the state, uh, will start to constrain that I think that sort of federal spending that benefits Alaska, we have that longer term concern when uh, when the interest rate uh, bomb goes off. But the but there's a nearer term effect on Alaska that I think is is interesting. As all this additional spending occurs in the near term, a lot of that will be will come into Alaska. I mean, if we if we have these two thousand dollars stimulus payments. Uh, if they work their way through Congress, they'll come into to Alaska. If we have additional state and local government aid uh, in the Biden administration as a result of uh, of COVID, as as part of a next uh, COVID relief bill, that will come into Alaska. And so, and so, we need to be conscious that that we may have, as a result of this theory of that that doesn't matter, all this additional aid coming into Alaska. That has two impacts. One. We, we may see more money coming into Alaska from the federal government. But two, we need to be careful then what, what we're doing on the state side. I mean, Governor Dunleavy has talked about uh, additional state aid or additional state spending, additional state uh, uh, dollars 
uh, going into the economy because of his, because of the concerns about COVID. Well, if we have a bunch of federal dollars coming into the state, we don't need, we're not going to need to pile on additional state dollars on top of that. We have a certain amount of need. If the federal government is taking care of that need uh, through additional spending, uh, that lessens the, uh, uh, the, the, the need for state aid, particularly since that additional state aid that Governor Dunleavy is talking about would come at the expense of future generations by drawing down uh, the permanent fund uh, earnings reserve beyond uh, uh, the, the sustainable number that the, that the legislature set uh, in statute. So it's, 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 a, it's a two-pronged process, or it's a two-pronged effect that, that, that Alaskans need to be aware of. One is the near-term effect that it may generate a lot more dollars coming into the state uh, which would be positive uh, for the state in the short term, both from the standpoint of additional aid in the state and reducing the amount of, of draws we need to make on our state's reserves, preserving more for future generations. But the longer term impact of setting up some sort of time of sub, setting up some sort of interest bomb, uh, debt bomb uh, at the federal level. Uh, that down the road could have uh, uh, an adverse impact on the ability of the federal government to uh, to send uh, uh, regular dollars, even regular dollars, uh, into Alaska. Uh, it's a it's a sometimes things in D.C. really what goes on in D.C. really doesn't matter to Alaska that much. But this this sort of new drive uh, on the Democrat side to increase spending and justify the increase in spending and say it doesn't really matter, I think uh, uh, potentially has a big impact, as I say, both in the short term and the long term. You keep saying the Biden administration, uh, YJ asked, Brad. Don't you mean the Harris administration? I mean, even Joe Biden can't keep it straight. President-elect Harris, President-elect Harris. I think he said that like three times now in one of his speeches. President-elect Harris. Uh, it's, but it's going to be a whole new, it's going to be a whole new, uh, uh, ball of wax here in just a little bit. And we're going to have to face the facts that, uh, there's going to be some direct impacts on what we're doing. Yeah. And, and I think, uh, I think the, the today's election in, uh, in Georgia is, uh, is going to be significant to that. I mean, a lot of people say that if the Democrats win both seats, uh, all of a sudden, you know, Biden has free reign. Uh, on on voting, I don't think that's right. Uh, there are Democrats, not many, but there are Democratic Democratic senators led by uh, Joe Manchin out of uh, West Virginia, but also including Michael Bennett out of Colorado and others who are who are are as close to blue dog Democrats, uh, conservative fiscally conservative Democrats as you get in the current Congress. And I think you know just like. Uh, the Trump administration has complained about Murkowski and and uh, and and uh, uh, Romney and 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 others. Uh, I think you'll find progressive Democrats starting to complain about Manchin and Bennett, and Bennett uh, and and others as well, because I think they'll 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 hold a break on uh, on on runaway uh, right. things in the, Dem- in the Democrat administration. Well, but, yeah, I mean his his job will be. I mean he he'll be able to get things, but he has to have a sixty. He has to have a sixty vote bulletproof majority to really be able to push stuff through. And if it's just an even split, it's going to make it a lot harder to to do. But he will have a clearer road for his agenda if he does end up with a democratically controlled Senate. Yeah, exactly right. And and you know the sixty. <laughs> The Republicans set the precedent of rolling back the filibuster, um, and and it's a, you know, the nuclear option of changing the rules. I mean, filibuster exists by rule; it doesn't exist by constitutional provision. It doesn't even exist by statute; it exists by Senate rule, and it's been a tradition to roll that, uh, to roll that forward, regardless of who's in control of Congress. The Republicans set the set the set the precedent. Well, the Democrats started it, and then the Republicans have expanded. Uh, the fact that uh, uh, that filibuster doesn't apply to executive po- appointments. So, for example, you can run court appointments through uh, uh, or court nominations, uh, uh, Supreme Court and other court nominations through with a majority vote. The, the Republicans did that uh, by uh, changing the rules. And uh, there's been some uh, discussion of the Senate Democrats doing that, changing the rules even further. Uh, being able to run legislation through by majority, uh, uh, just eliminating the filibuster altogether, that's a possibility. Um, and the other thing is, uh, on fiscal matters, you can always use, you can always, but but you it, you can use a process called budget reconciliation, which is how the Republicans ran through 
the 2017 tax cuts right. uh, with just a majority vote. Right. Uh, you can use budget reconciliation. Uh, the de- Democrats could use budget reconciliation to run through uh, tax and fiscal measures uh, uh, by majority vote without even changing the filibuster. Uh, let me go back to the chat room here. Donna Ardwin says, uh, did Brad just say that the Ronald Reagan tax cuts didn't work? Um, I don't think that's what you said, but I'll let you answer that. Oh, yeah. Trickle down didn't work. I mean, uh, uh, they didn't work under I mean, you can go through a long analysis of this, but trickle down didn't work under Reagan. They didn't work under Bush and they didn't they haven't worked under under uh, 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 Trump. Um, they what, what trickle down really did was it, it trickled into the hands of the top 10 percent. Uh, but it never really got down to middle and, and lower income uh, uh, families. So, um, it, it, and now the Democrats are, are are pushing the same approach on the on the Democrat side with the uh, with the debt doesn't matter argument. Uh, Brad Keithley, Alaskans for sustainable budgets. Uh, let me see here. What else do we got here? Dems don't play that way. Uh, oh, Dems don't play the way Republicans do. Says Jim, they will all get they will all get in line when needed, blue dog or not. I. I disagree with that because, again, I've seen blue dog Democrats. I mean, going back to I think Zell Miller really was one of the first ones that I really uh, admired uh, for a guy who basically, you know, said, you know, he wrote the book A National Party No More when he said, you know, I didn't leave the Democratic Party. The Democratic Party left me. And and it was in its continuous pursuit of the progressive ideal. I think that he was one of the first uh, casualties in the modern era anyway of that kind of stuff. So I think it will happen. Oh, Manchin, Manchin in particular. I mean, Manchin is a is a Democrat in a Republican state. Joe has a, a an appeal to that state's former governor, um, but he's he's very careful uh, in terms of the positions he takes, particularly on 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 fiscal matters. And um, and I think we haven't seen that because uh, we haven't we haven't. I mean, we've had Trump the last four years, and we've had a we've had a Republican yeah. Senate. But uh, but I think when uh, uh, if if we end up with a Democrat Senate, I see your I think you're going to see Manchin come and Michael Bennett out of Colorado and others. I think you're going to see them play a, a much much more important uh, role and 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 mentioned more often as by uh, uh, by progressive Democrats as a as a problem. We're talking about Reagan tax cuts. Uh, I think the Reagan tax cut and the Trump tax cut were two very different things in the long run. Because tax cuts only really work when you have a commensurate cut in spending, uh, and I think that's I think that's the major difference between the Reagan and the Trump tax cuts. Uh, I mean, we've had we've talked at length here about the, how the Trump tax cuts have created problems because while they cut it, they cut the tax. Uh, for Americans, and that's not necessarily a bad thing. If they don't have commensurate cuts in the federal spending, then all you do is create more debt in the long run, which just exacerbates the problem. Yeah, but we didn't have spending cuts in the Reagan Reagan years either. I mean, there, there's Michael. There's all sorts of studies that go back and look at the at the Reagan tax cuts. I, I know I know what the 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 popular um, reaction to the Reagan tax cuts is, but there's all sorts of studies that go back and look at the Reagan tax cuts and say that the trickle down didn't work. There's a new study out of Britain that's looked at at, at tax cuts, the trickle down theory for the last 50 years in in governments worldwide. And, and has concluded that uh, I, I posted this on on the page last week or the week before last. I'll repost it uh, 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 sometime this week. Uh, but that study has said there's never been uh, a, a set of tax cuts that that produce uh, that pay for themselves. Pay for themselves. I mean, that's that's what we're talking about here. Uh, that yeah, they do boost economic activity in the sense that when you when you pay lower taxes, you can. You, you, you have dollars that you can engage in higher economic t- activity. But the question is whether they pay them for themselves. The question is whether that increased economic activity at the lower tax rates produces the same amount or higher uh, level of, uh, of government revenues uh, than, than they did before. And, and the answer is no, they don't. Uh, uh, that that not the the Reagan tax cuts didn't do that the Bush tax cuts didn't do that uh, and the uh, and the and the and the uh, Trump tax cuts uh, haven't done that. You're right. If we could reduce spending at the same time that we reduce taxes, if we reduce the you know the cost of government at the same time we reduce revenues, uh, you know, they they might have the chance of doing that. But we've not 
we've not we didn't do that in Reagan. We didn't do that in Bush, and we haven't. And I, I think yet. people are misunderstanding the yardstick that you're trying to use here. Versus, I mean, they will spur economic growth, but the your 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 yardstick is not economic growth. Your yardstick is: Are they sustainable? Do they pay for themselves in the long run? I think that's where I think that's where the disconnect here is with some of the listeners. Correct. Correct. Do yeah. they increase debt? Do they increase Do they increase national debt? Do they right. increase deficits? And do they increase national debt? And the yeah. answer is that that Reagan did. Bush did, and and Trump has. They've increased national debt. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budget, is our guest. We're moving on from number two of the weekly top three to the final one, number three here. Got about four and a half minutes, Brad. The uh, ANS price, the, the price of oil is up. That's a good thing or what? Well, it is a good thing. I mean, the, the near-term price of, uh, of, of ANS or the current price of ANS has crossed $50. And as I said in the first segment, uh, that fifty dollars is likely to produce about three hundred million dollars of additional revenue uh, in the current fiscal year, which will reduce uh, the amount of the CBR draw we're having to make in the current fiscal year, increase the amount of sl- increase by three hundred million dollars, but but increase the amount of CBR that, that's that's available as a cushion for uh, uh, the the coming f- the coming fiscal year. Uh, and, uh, and 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 that's a positive thing. But here's here's the thing that uh, that people I think need to focus on. That fifty dollars is that increase in price in the near term is is very positive. But you need to look. You, you can't just focus on the near term oil price. You have to look across uh, uh, into the future, uh, into the ten year period, and see what oil prices are doing. And and while current oil prices are up. Uh, uh, longer-term oil prices, I- in a real uh, uh, after inflation uh, 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 sense, are 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 going down. Uh, uh, the current price of oil is above fifty dollars. The projected price, uh, when you look at the futures market, the projected price for oil for next fiscal year is above fifty dollars. But then in FY twenty three, the futures market says. Uh, it's 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 down to right at fifty dollars, and then it goes down to forty nine dollars uh, in in subsequent fiscal years. The ten year outlook that the governor is using has oil prices increasing. It has uh, oil prices by FY twenty nine at fifty six dollars. The futures market is uh, is at forty nine dollars. So y- you don't want the fact that the current price is 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 going up which is a good thing. You don't want that to mask the the longer term outlook outlook of oil prices in fact going down, real oil prices uh going down. And when you're setting fiscal policy this coming legislative session, you're setting it not only for next fiscal year, but you you should be looking at at the impact and setting fiscal policy for the next 10 years and actually with oil prices declining below the the ten year even the low prices in the in the ten year projection, the out years the 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 years two, three, four, five through ten uh, down the road are looking worse uh, as a result of the drop in uh, in real oil prices. Our fiscal situation looks worse uh, as a result of what's going on in current oil oil markets so I know there's a lot of euphoria um, well, euphoria may be, the, may be too, uh, too uh, positive a word. I know there's a lot of uh, good feelings about, about the current increase in oil price, but, but we need to be concerned about the longer term as well as we set fiscal policy uh, for the coming decade. I looked at this chart that you sent over and uh, that I had up on the screen here, and all I could think of as I looked at this and I look at the projections, and all I could think of was the um, – uh, you know, was when Sean Parnell was writing budgets based on revenue projections of $117 a barrel when the actual re- when the actual pricing at the time was like $79 a barrel and actually went down from there. Uh, I mean, is this part of the problem that we're that we're you know we're we're basing it on these ten year forecasts, which um, you know again are just best estimated guesses kind of thing? Or what what is your thought on that? Well, the the, the you have to be realistic about these forecasts, right? I mean. You, the problem in the in the twenty teens was we assumed those oil prices would would last forever, and 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 we didn't take into account that they were abnormally high, and we were producing abnormally high revenues that we should have been saving a significant part of to cushion us against against uh, 
periods when oil prices uh, fell back. We should have been looking for the median as opposed to as opposed to riding that high and spending spending all we could. What what the futures market are, is telling us now is there is significant concern about long term oil prices, and and we shouldn't be basing our our current policies on the assumption that you know fifty dollars are is 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 the current price and that's going to last forever or it's going to go up from fifty dollars. Uh, like the 10-year forecast would tell us, we need to, we need to take into account that the futures market people who are putting real money uh, out there are telling us that there's a long-term concern about oil prices, and 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 these may be this may be the good time in terms of oil prices, uh, as as opposed to you know sort of the floor from which we're going to climb again. You, know, we, we made a mistake in the 20 teens <coughs> by assuming oil prices were always going to stay where they were, or they were going to go up from there. We can we can easily make the same mistake again. Even at these lower prices, we can easily make the same mistake again. Uh, we're already economically challenged, uh, fiscally challenged going forward. Uh, when you look at the ten-year plan, and what and what oil futures are telling us is that may be that that may be the good uh, case uh, that there may be uh, even more challenge. And as we as we get into this legislation legislative session, and we look at you know, fixing this fiscal problem once and for all, fixing this fiscal problem by developing a, a new uh, a new fiscal approach. We need to take into account that oil prices, uh, in fact, the futures market is telling us that oil prices are, in real dollar terms, are going down. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. As always, an interesting conversation. Uh, I know some people don't agree, but I think it's always good to have uh, at least the ideas out there, if nothing else, to at least kick around and talk about Thank you so much for coming on board and joining us this morning. We appreciate you being part of it, as Michael, always. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the Weekly Top 3 from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember, you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, and Spotify pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the weekly top three.